Today we're going to be overclocking the 3300X and also the 3100 and seeing how high they can go on water. And another thing is too, we're gonna to be using the 280mm H115i RGB Platinum. This thing is pretty quiet. It's also really good for cooling. I mean, four cores though, we don't have to ask a whole lot out of cooling. So if you're in the market for say, getting just something a bit better than the Ray Stealth, how much more performance could you expect? We're gonna be checking out that very soon, but what we're doing here is setting up the PC. And one thing you can do with, uh, if you've got any Ryzen system, is make sure you download your chipset drivers. This one I got from the AMD website themselves, and essentially just squeezes out a little bit more performance. You can sometimes get an extra 2% performance if you didn't have these installed, versus then you install it and you get that more performance. Uh, we've also got hardware monitor here. This is just gonna tell us especially our all core speeds. So with that aside, I'll let the overclocking begin, y'all. If one of your lifelong dreams is to get rid of that Windows 10 needs activation message, then you can make that dream come true. With today's video sponsor, SCD Keys, you can get a Windows 10 Pro single end user license for as little as 15 US dollars using the coupon code TYCSK. Delivery of the keys is your instant, just copy paste it into Windows 10 activation, and then you're good to go. Links in description below. So here is Cinebench R20 being stress tested, and what we can see here is that the 3300X is going up to around 4.25 to 4.275 gigahertz, which is higher than what it does on the Wraith Stealth. And this in ways is to thank the uh, AMD Precision Boost, which is detecting that the CPU is now running cooler, so it can boost a little bit higher. So it's a really good out of the box uh, system that they're going on with Zen 2. This was one of my favorite things about Zen 2, especially if you weren't an overclocker. And we can see that here just with the performance of this thing out of the box. So what we're gonna do here is see that we need to beat 4.275 gigahertz when we overclock, but at the same time, that's a good base point to start at. And we're gonna quickly see our score and know that when we go into the BIOS and then try to manually overclock, we've got to go for some higher numbers here. So first time lucky with this overclock here, 4.4 gigahertz all cores, and we just quickly, I'm gonna say the best word to say this, we just quickly scooped up an extra 130 points in Cinebench R20, but why stop there? Let's see where this thing can max out at and go harder. Ooh, <laughs> So now we've just finished up here with a Cinebench R20 score, uh, 4.5 gigahertz, which is really impressive. This is the highest I have had an all-core Ryzen CPU in the history of the channel here. Very impressed with this overclock, considering it's 26 degrees ambient in here. Now, this is the funny thing about overclocks, right? There's gonna be Sven from Sweden, and he's gonna come into the comment section like, Brian, I got my uh, CPU to 4.6 gigahertz or core what are you doing and my reply to that is like Sven stop putting your computer outside where it's like minus five degrees and bring it back inside and make sure you use it at a normal ambient temperature and so basically that's a big factor with overclocks is your ambient temperatures and so 26 degrees ambient 4.5 gigahertz, I'm super happy with this overclock. But of course, we're gonna run some gaming numbers now and then switch over to the 3100 and then come back and see the differences. And now we've been spending some quality time with the 3100 and it almost made it through a 4.6 gigahertz pass in Cinebench R20. Mind you, we are going overboard with the voltage and it doesn't matter if we give it that little bit more, it's just responding even worse this time around. Scary thing is when I'm stress testing this, it's uh, almost juicing around 100 watts and that's for a four core. So that is not something we really wanna be doing if we wanna make sure our seven nanometer four core has a long life. But with that aside, what we're gonna try and do now is get 4.575 gigahertz or 4,575 megahertz and stress test that in games to see how it compares to the 3300X.
And now I've just finished overclocking both these chips to 4.575 gigahertz. They both managed to run in the games and in the stress test, or at least Cinebench at these frequencies. Now, first thing I'm gonna say is with these frequencies is it's not a good idea to be running this CPU at around 1.49 volts uh, day in, day out. I'm just doing this for benchmarks and showing what's possible. And the first graph I'm gonna show up here is what is possible. And it really took me back and I opened my eyes because this was the first time I've legitimately seen an AMD Zen 2 CPU in Fortnite beat out the 9900KS. And this was a really good score. I mean, it's, look, it's one FPS, it's 0 .0 something percent, but it's still a victory and it still shows you that when Zen 3 comes out, and if that's got a more mature seven nanometer or if it's got better IPC, we're going to see even higher FPS. And that could beat out Intel as not only price performance king, but performance king too. So that was one of the most exciting benchmarks. But then we saw the contrast between the 3300X and the 3100. 3300X being on that single CCX module did make a little bit of a difference in both the Cinebench scores and also the gaming benchmarks where it did score just slightly higher FPS as well as slightly higher single core and multi-threaded score in Cinebench too. So having those four cores on a single CCX module versus the two cores on two CCX modules in this right here, the Ryzen 3100, is more beneficial to go with the 3300X, ever so slightly. It's not a huge difference in games, or at least in Cinebench R20, but it was a little bit of a difference. And I guess if you wanna go down this route and get the best FPS possible for competitive games, then the 3300X is a nice little CPU. I was blown away by how good both these four core eight threaded CPUs are. But one thing I will say is we got so close to 4.6 gigahertz, but it just wasn't happening, at least in my ambient temperatures. But talking a little bit more about the practicality of this setup right here, it's just not really practical to go with 4.575 gigahertz day in, day out. And as we said before, the voltage, that'll make short work of the chip in probably even like something like a month, you'll see chip degradation at these voltages. But another thing too, is that we're using a X570 Phantom Gaming X, we're using an HX 1000 watt power supply, we're using quite an expensive 280 mil all-in-one liquid cooler. So all that gear together on a $120 and $99 CPU doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The value for money is just gone out the window. But one thing that it does show you is, say for instance you've got a water cooler lying around and you maybe find a cheap X370 motherboard on the used market, you can get both of those, put them together, get a 3100 and get some really good performance in games. Or if you got the extra 20 bucks, getting the 3300X. I think both these CPUs are great at their price point, $99, 120 bucks, but at the same time, you can couple them with an A320 and use the included cooler and get some really good performance out of the box. And I guess that's what kind of I would come out of this video saying is, especially with the 3300X, you don't really need to overclock at all. The 3100, you may wish to go with the B450 and you can definitely extract a little more performance out of it. You could easily get that to 4.2 gigahertz, uh, even on the race stealth cooler. But one thing we did see, and one thing I will point out, and I'll show you this graph right here, was the power consumption at 5.575 gigahertz, both having the same voltages, same motherboard, same everything. The 3100 was using an extra 10 watts. So some of that will come down to the chip itself, but also going across two CCX modules does create more inefficiency, at least at these levels, where the differences are going to be exponentially worse than they otherwise would at lower clock speeds. Hopefully I'm making sense and not rambling. So concluding this video, both these CPUs overclock extremely well. I'm guessing you'd be able to get 4.4 gigahertz on both the 3100 and the 3300X day in, day out with a decent cooling solution and a decent motherboard and power supply. But ultimately, if you are buying new and you wish to extract the most value for money, just go out and get a budget motherboard, use the included cooler, and then just enjoy the thing out of the box because it's gonna still give you some great FPS. And with all that aside, do let us know in the comments section below what you think about overclocking these two Ryzen chips right here. 
Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always. I feel personally overclocking at least on air or water is really diminishing really fast. Precision boost and stuff like that is doing a really good job of finding the sweet spot where the extra power consumption was that we didn't even get an extra 10% out of the 3300X. But the 3100, we did get quite a sizable boost in terms of performance. But that being said, is it worth it? I think not. Though we do have the question of the day here, which comes from Brandon Fear Delane, and they ask, thing is in the future, are more games gonna be optimized for more cores? I saw this in a Bitwit video, so I'm a bit torn. This is a really good question, and you usually got two sides of the fence. I'm on the side of the fence of buy what is best for now. And the reason behind this is because I've seen a lot of different games come and go, and it's usually the most popular games tailor their games to low end hardware. And this is quite simply because they have to cater to the whole world market. And they know that people in, for instance, third world countries that can't afford a six core 12 threaded CPU will then buy their game because they're gonna get a good experience on it. And hopefully that in turn will, they may have a couple of bucks on them and they can go and buy some in-game items. So they're still gonna make money off that person just as they'd make money off the person who can afford that six core 12 threaded CPU and will still enjoy the game regardless. So now that we can see what most game developers will want to do, we can then sort of ascertain that, hey, not until we see uh, six cores, 12 threads being the entry level CPU, that's when we'll, and it's widespread, of course, it's mass spread out there. Everyone's buying a six core, 12 thread CPU, even on the used market. That's when I feel like we'll see mass adoption to more cores, more threads. It won't be force fed. And so we're stuck in this place at the moment where four cores, eight threads, and even four cores, four threads is still so popular in how many people own that PC and that's a potential player base. So is four cores, eight threads gonna be fine? I'd say yes, I feel it's gonna be fine for another couple of years yet, especially popular multiplayer titles, which most people are playing. Hopefully that answers that question. And if you guys enjoyed today's video, then be sure to hit that like button for us. And if you stayed this far and you're enjoying that content, then you know what to do, ring that sub button. Yeah, just ring the sub button and you'll get the videos the moment they drop and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye. That's right, just ring the sub button. Just ring it at 4.575 gigahertz. Oh.